Hazoni Attacks the Enlightenment. Yoram Hazoni, a conservative nationalist intellectual, made a five-minute video published by Prager University on December 30th, uh, 2019. I'll uh, include the link. Uh, This Open College podcast is recorded a week later after several people sent the video link to me for comment. I uh, thank them for sending the, the link to me, and I share their shocked reactions at how bad the history in the video is. By my count, uh, Hazoni makes eight major claims about the Enlightenment. Uh, One of them is correct, and the other seven are false, or at most they contain grains of truth that are badly exaggerated. There are, in fact, thoughtful arguments against the Enlightenment that can be made, but Harzoni has not made them. This is, uh, this is bad history. But first, let me uh, walk through the eight claims that uh, Harzoni makes, and I'll try to present them just concisely and in the spirit in which he makes them. So here they are. What is the Enlightenment first? Number one, well, the Enlightenment means these themes, an advocacy of science, modern medicine, freedom politically, markets, free markets economically, a belief in progress, reason, and so forth. Those are the themes Arzonia emphasizes as constituting the Enlightenment worldview. Two, the Enlightenment's advocates, however, say that it happened fast. It happened, quote, suddenly, uh, about 250 years ago, that it was, quote, unquote, a miracle. But in fact, lots of things happened first prior to make the Enlightenment happen and to make it possible. The Enlightenment thinkers idolize, quote unquote, reason and hold its results to be, quote unquote, infallible. But this is clearly false because if we look just, for example, at the history of the U.S. Constitution, we can find antecedents of it in the 15th century and in the 17th century. So the Enlightenment, contrary to its defenders, don't deserve all the credit. There are pre-Enlightenment thinkers who helped make it possible. And especially Immanuel Kant is an example of one of those Enlightenment intellectuals who are claiming that all great things come from the Enlightenment. Third, the Enlightenment means a rejection totally of tradition and an advocacy of revolution and starting everything all over again. But that is a bad position because not only is there much good in tradition, we ourselves are essentially creatures of tradition and we function best within traditions. Fourth, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a man of the Enlightenment. But his views were responsible for the French Revolution and Napoleon, and both of those were very bad things. Fifth, Karl Marx was an Enlightenment figure who saw himself as promoting a universal science of reason, but obviously communism is very bad, so the Enlightenment that spawned Karl Marx is also a bad thing. Sixth, the Enlightenment led to the Nazis, Adolf Hitler, Goebbels, the Holocaust, and so forth, including their supposedly scientific race theories. The Nazis saw themselves as advocating reason. Seventh, environmentalism and feminism are two dogmatic ideologies that are plaguing our own timeline, but they too are heirs of the Enlightenment, and so once again, or twice again, the Enlightenment is a bad thing because of its responding these results. And then eighth, and finally, a better tradition of the time, uh, modernity, is the more moderate skeptical tradition of David Hume, Adam Smith, Edmund Burke, and other intellectuals. They are not so enamored of abstract reason, holding abstract reason especially to be unreliable. But it is they who have contributed most to the progress that we have made by urging us to stick with custom, tradition, and experience. All right, that's my initial summary of uh, Harzoni's eight major claims about the Enlightenment and why he is opposed to it. Now let's take up these eight claims in turn, and I'll just march through each of them saying what I think is good, but mostly what is wrong with the, with the eight claims. First, I do think uh, Hazoni starts with a pretty good summary of what the Enlightenment means. He's correct to identify that it's a belief in science, uh, in modern medicine, in freedom, markets, belief in progress, 
is possible in reason and so forth. So I think that's a that's a pretty good summary. I would add, though, an important uh, ethical theme, and that is the theme of individualism, uh, that reason functions as a function of individuals, that it's creative thinking by individual scientists and, uh, and medical thinkers, that reason is not a collective process, that when we're talking about freedom and markets, to make clear that we're talking about individual freedoms, individual rights, and that when we're talking about markets, it's individual buyers and sellers. So the theme of individualism, I think, is important to underlie or to emphasize that it underlies many of those more applied Enlightenment themes. Now, perhaps has only means for the individualism to be folded into the freedom and markets theme and the reason theme. He just haven't, doesn't have enough time to highlight, and that's fine. But another important Enlightenment theme is the theme of religious toleration, and uh, toleration more broadly, but especially the battles over religion that re- led, led to toleration. And again, toleration for individuals and their own judgment and the freedom to pursue their own matters, that was uh, an important component. And the toleration theme, I think, also deserves to be emphasized. And then also the theme of equality should, I believe, be highlighted against feudal classisms and traditional sexism, traditional slavery, and so forth, that political rights, political freedoms, uh, economic rights, and so forth, that reason is spread out and should be seen as a faculty that all individuals share equally, that we all equally have the potential or should have the, the the freedom to pursue our own our, our own judgments and so forth. So I would highlight the uh, the theme of equality as well. But nonetheless, that first point is pretty fine. Second, though, here I think Harzoni starts to be a little disingenuous. His presentation of the Enlightenment understanding of the way reason works. Notice that he uses the term, the Enlightenment, as a miracle, right, that results from the application of reason. And miracle is obviously a term that has a long religious terminology, uh, that reason is an idol, right, or that, that, that Enlightenment thinkers are idolizing reason. And again, Religious idols is uh, is meant to be a connotation that we're to pick up on here, or the idea that reason is somehow infallible. Again, it's religious traditions that want the Pope to be infallible, for mystical pronouncements to be infallible, for their, their gods to be uh, infallible beings, right, and so forth. And I believe, uh, you know, obviously that what Hazoni is trying to do is just to say that the Enlightenment is just one more religion. But this is disingenuous, if not outright dishonest, because absolutely no Enlightenment figure uses that religious language. They do not ever characterize religion as a miracle. They do not idolize religion. They don't hold religion to be infallible. Instead, all the Enlightenment made figures from uh, Rene Descartes to friend Francis Bacon and John Locke and Isaac Newton and the others will argue that reason is a lot of hard work by human beings. It's also not a miracle in the sense of some sort of inexplicable magic, but reason, once it's operated and how it operates, is an intelligible process, and the results that we attain by reason, they are explainable. So religion is not infallible. It's not something to be idolized. Rather, uh, Francis Bacon especially right, went out of his way to say that there are all sorts of cognitive biases uh, that he calls idols, that human psychology is prey to, and that we uh, often have to uh, do a lot of work to untrain ourselves, perhaps bad habits that we have acquired, precisely not to make certain habits of thinking idols, that we have to do a lot of hard work, a lot of training, a lot of exercises, individuals to train our minds, to train our reason. Uh, to, in order to be able to use it well. Also, it is not infallible. No scientific uh, or enlightenment thinker ever takes reason to be infallible. It takes a lot of trial and error, a lot of failed experiments, a lot of conversation, a lot of argument with other people with different theories to fine-tune our own theories. And in many cases, the enlightenment thinkers are prizing debates and other forms of social learning as, uh, if not essential, as very important tools for all of us as individuals to learn. So all of this language about miracles and idols and infallible, I think, is entirely inappropriate by Hazoni to use in characterizing the Enlightenment understanding of reason. A related point, uh, Hazoni also characterizes the Enlightenment theory and the Enlightenment theorist as saying that the Enlightenment suddenly happened 250 years ago. 
I think this is uh, kind of stupid. I don't know if this is just a slip of the tongue, but there's a kind of a false precision that's being foisted on the Enlightenment view here. If we take it's 250 years, why 250 years ago? That would then be say that the Enlightenment happened in 1770. Suppose we broaden it and said, oh, it happened in the decade of the 1770s. But that's obviously faulty. It's false to any informed understanding of the Enlightenment, even the Enlightenment thinkers themselves. There's Voltaire who's doing his formative writing in the 1720s, and that's 50 years, half a century before 1770. So already we're back to 300 years prior to that. Long uh, almost all the Enlightenment thinkers will say Locke is absolutely the Enlightenment thinker par excellence, if not perhaps Isaac Newton as the other. Uh, the other, But Locke is doing his major publishing in the 1690s, Newton in the 1680s. Almost all of them will harken back to uh, Francis Bacon publishing in the 1620s. Some will uh, give props to Rene Descartes also publishing in the 1630s, 1640s, and so forth. So again, we're going back a century a century and a half before 1770. So absolutely every Enlightenment thinker also will recognize that there are important antecedents. It's not suddenly in 1770 or even in the, the latter part of the 1700s that the Enlightenment springs into existence. The, the scientific ones will harken back to Copernicus and Galileo doing important work in the 1500s and 1600s in physics and astronomy. The uh, sciences of, uh, of uh, physiology and biology, they will harken back to Vesalius and uh, Harvey doing important work in the 1500s. The political Enlightenment thinkers will harken back to the Republican experiments of Florence and Venice in the 1400s. And they'll all go back to Rome, you know, a, a, a millennium and a half and further before, or even farther, 2,000 years to the ex democratic experiments of Athens. All of the hard-won lessons of religious toleration, that was not suddenly something that happened in the 1750s or the 1770s. Instead, that's ex reflecting on the experience of the 1500s and the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. And all of them will harken back to the Dutch, especially in the early 1600s, as first learning the lessons and saying, by the time we get to the 1700s, hey, let's learn from the Dutch already and what they did a century ago. And then the English with their acts of toleration in the 1680s. All of this is a century before this false precision date of 1770 that Hazoni wants us to, to imagine. A third uh, point here, just on this uh, uh, 1770s, obviously Immanuel Kant is doing his publications in the 1770s and 1780s and starting to slow down, but still publishing in the 1790s. But uh, arguing that Kant is uh, an Enlightenment figure is extraordinarily controversial. Uh, almost everyone will recognize in some ways Kant is an Enlightenment figure, but in some ways he's very conservative and very disturbed by the Enlightenment and trying to uh, put up limitations on what can be known by the Enlightenment. It's important to note that his most important book is The Critique of Pure Reason, and the themes of The Critique of Pure Reason are, are, are explicitly to say that there are limits to what reason can do. Reason is not the be-all and end-all for Kant. It's not infallible. It can't know everything. Said Kant wants to argue explicitly and on principle that uh, the most important truth about reality cannot be known by reason. So he denies explicitly that uh, we can have uh, knowledge of the most important truth by reason. And that precisely for Kant's view, this is a good thing because he wants to make room for certain kinds of faith, for certain kinds of religions. And so he's very much a, a, a mixed figure. I'm not sure that Hazoni has read anything beyond Kant's uh, one famous essay on the Enlightenment. Third major point where uh, Hazoni singles out Jean-Jacques Rousseau and argues that he's a man of the Enlightenment. And of course, his agenda here is many of the uh, French revolutionaries, uh, Robespierre, uh, Marat, uh, uh, and so forth, uh, were a Saint-Just, uh, to, to name a third. Very bloodthirsty and nasty individuals were disciples of Rousseau. And so if we can label Rousseau as a, a man of the Enlightenment, then we can uh, say that the Enlightenment led to the disasters of the French Enlightenment. But again, I'm not sure that Hazoni has read very much of, uh, of Rousseau, but have you, have you read his prize-winning essay, the essay that made uh, Rousseau famous, his famous discourse on the sciences and the arts? He absolutely hates science. He hates modern medicine. 
This is a, a, another theme that's picked up on uh, uh, Rousseau's other famous uh, essay, The Discourse on the Origin of Inequality, where uh, Rousseau goes out of his way to argue against the Enlightenment argument that we've made progress. Rousseau argues that precisely history is a history of human decline. Modernity is a story of decadence. He despises re reason, preferring to see human beings as creatures of instinct and sentiment. He's not a modern individualist in favor of markets. Instead, he argues that human beings back in pre-modern tribal times, that's when human beings were at their best. Uh, if you read his uh, social contract uh, published in the 1760s, it's a highly collectivist uh, political theory. It's highly authoritarian. It's uh, contemporary socialists and communists and proto-communalists who hearken back to Rousseau, uh, finding in him all of their anti-enlightenment themes. Uh, Rousseau is very anti-individualist, anti toleration, anti-separation of church and state, anti-free speech in favor of censoring the press, closing down the theaters, and so forth. So, you know, it's breathtaking to me that, uh, you know, three or four minutes before he mentions Rousseau, Hazoni has def uh, given six defining features of the Enlightenment. Three minutes later, he mentions Rousseau, but Rousseau is explicitly anti all six of the features that Hazoni mentions as characterizing the Enlightenment. You can't find a more anti-Enlightenment thinker operating in the 1700s than Jean-Jacques Rousseau. But again, the point here is that Rousseau was in part responsible for some of the elements that occurred in the French Revolution. There's a French Revolution is a very complicated story, but there's at least three phases of the French Revolution. Any competent historian of the French Revolution says there's an aristocratic phase, there's a classical liberal individualistic phase, and then there's a third phase that is much more collectivistic, Rousseau-driven, and bloodthirsty. So there's, you know, a half-truth here, maybe a one-third truth. You can say that Rousseau's views are responsible for the disaster part of the French Revolution, but the disaster part of the French Revolution was explicitly anti-Enlightenment uh, and so forth. Fourth point, uh, Karl Marx, uh, being an Enlightenment figure who saw himself as promoting a universal science of reason, and then, you know, obviously communism was a, was a major disaster of the 20th century. Well, uh, you know, what do we say here? Uh, you know, it's true, Marx did see himself as a scientific socialist, right, and so forth. But if you look at Marx's philosophy, more fundamentally, he is uh, not at all advocating a universal science of reason. He is a relativist. He argues that human beings in their cognitive habits, their cognitive thinking, their, their function of their environmental circumstances and people growing up in different environmental circumstances will have entirely differently constituted reasons. He's a polylogist. He's also an anti-individualist. He's anti-markets and so on. So if you're going to argue that universal reason is what the Enlightenment believes in, well, Marx is a relativist. He doesn't believe in universal reason. If you're going to say, Hazoni, that uh, the Enlightenment is characterized by a belief in freedom and markets, well, Marx is anti-freedom, he's anti-markets, and so on. So please, uh, let's not go down that road. All right, fifth point, the Enlightenment as spawning the Nazis with their so-called scientific race theories, and again, that the, the, uh, the, uh, the Nazis saw themselves as advocating reason. Uh, just absolutely false. Hitler, Goebbels, uh, condemnatory of reason, both of them arguing that human beings do not operate on reason. Human beings are creatures of instinct. They're creatures of the tribe, the whole blood and soil tradition that we're going to appeal to humans' collective passions, not their individual minds, uh, that most individuals are not, of, of course, capable of thinking very deeply about anything. So the Enlightenment uh, view that individuals have the power of reason, and that's why we can give them all kinds of freedom and have democratic republics and give individuals rights, the Nazis are rejecting all of that. If you look at the intellectuals, Oswald Spengler, who is Nazi-friendly, Heidegger, who is a gung-ho Nazi, Carl Schmitt, another gung-ho Nazi. All of them are anti-reason in their formal epistemologies, anti-scientific, right, and so forth. And then if you go further back uh, in the intellectual tradition, Hegel, Marx, and Nietzsche, all of them are 
anti-reason, anti-enlightenment in their, in their uh, philosophical approach. Now, the fact that the Nazis did use science pragmatically does not, uh, you know, on, on some occasions, you know, does not make their philosophy an enlightenment philosophy any more than, you know, in our generation, you can find Antifa thugs, neo-Nazi thugs. They're using iPhones and, uh, and, and setting up their meets, right, and so forth. But that doesn't, you know, the fact that they're using Apple iPhones doesn't mean that suddenly Antifa are pro-capitalist, right, or that the neo-Nazi thugs who are using iPhones are pro-capitalist and so forth. A pragmatic use of science and technology does not make one an Enlightenment thinker. There's a, this is a bit of a sixth point now, but kind of a throwaway remark from Hazoni, but it does say that environmentalism and feminism are dogmas, uh, but then he goes on to say that those two are also heirs of the Enlightenment. And here, uh, you know, I don't know what to say you know, about a throwaway dogma about things as complicated as feminism and environmentalism, but obviously there are many varieties of environmental philosophy. There are many varieties of feminism kicking around. Some of them are healthier, some of them are much sicker. And I'm pretty sure that Hazoni's strategy here just is to say, you know, take the sickest versions of environmentalism that you can think of and the sickest versions of feminism that you can think of and then say that, you know, they are a modern ideologies that have come into existence in the last hundred years. So therefore, they come out of the Enlightenment. But since he doesn't specify which ones precisely he does have in mind, I can very much, though, make a prediction. Once he gets down to brass tacks and says, this is the type of feminism or this is the type of environmentalism I have in mind, I am absolutely sure you will find that those versions of environmentalism and feminism are also anti-enlightenment. Seventh point. According to Hazoni, the Enlightenment means a rejection of tradition, an advocacy of revolution and starting over. He uses very uh, frequently the phrase cut loose from tradition. But I think the better way to think about the Enlightenment is to say the Enlightenment is absolutely in favor of cutting loose from some traditions and as quickly as possible, and that is to its credit. So obviously slavery has a long tradition, and to its credit, the Enlightenment, once it recognized that slavery was a moral abomination, it was very quick to try to cut loose from slavery and to mount a moral and a political and a legal revolution to get rid of slavery as fast as possible. Religious dogmatism, there's long traditions of religious dogmatism to its credit, right? Once religious dogmatism is identified as a stain on human history, yes, we do want to cut loose from that and uh, enact religious toleration and as quickly as possible enact separations of church and state and so forth. The long traditions of superstition in medicine, the burning of witches and so forth, you know, as soon as modern medicine recognizes uh, those superstitions as false, as damaging, all of the folklore and old wives' tales and, and traditional forms of, of, of medicine that as often as not are killing people or damaging them, the sooner we can cut loose from them, uh, the better. But the more important point that the Enlightenment made is not tradition is absolutely bad, but rather what we need to do is exercise judgment about tradition rather than critically accepting tradition. The pre-Enlightenment tradition is to idolize tradition and to idolize and to give uncritical authority to various sorts of scriptural or institutionalized political traditions just on the basis of that other people know better and that all of the important truths have been discovered prior to our own time and that the authorities are the ones who know best. But the point that the Enlightenment figures are, are identifying and all of them say pretty much the same thing, look, traditions can be good and traditions can be bad. And the question is, which ones are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones? And the only way we are going to do this is by asking hard questions about every single tradition that is out there and putting every tradition to the intellectual test and every student should put them to the test. You should, in fact, question authority. That doesn't mean that you're going to reject authority, but you have to uh, know what are the good arguments for the, uh, for the current authorities' positions. And if they don't have good arguments, then in fact, we will 
reject those uh, traditions. It's a false alternative that Hazoni seems to be asking us. Either we're going to have some sort of uncritical acceptance of traditions or we're going to have a total break with traditions. The Enlightenment position was uh, there are lots of bad traditions. The sooner we identify which ones are the bad ones and, and the sooner we reject them, the better we are. But there's much good. We're not going to throw babies out with bathwater and all of that. We, but we also have to uh, identify what's good in the good traditions and understand what's good about them in order to retain those and uh, to build upon them. And the only way we're going to do that is by exercising rational judgment about which is which. Now then more specifically here, Hazoni, this is now the eighth point. There's some sub points that are built into uh, this, uh, this one eighth point. He identifies David Hume, Adam Smith, Burke, and so forth. And uh, he adds an adjective at this point. He says, abstract reason really is the enemy. And that people like Smith and Burke and Hume are arguing that by we make progress by appealing tradition, to customs and building on tradition and local experiences and so forth. And what I think, and, and with all you know, respect to the fact that this is only a five-minute video and you can't say everything, what uh, Hazoni seems to be doing here, though, is uh, doing though is fusing three points there that are three questions that really need to be teased out. One question is, you know, is reason primary epistemologically? A second question, though, is how does reason work? And then a third question is, how competent is reason? And these are not the uh, the exact same question. There's a lot of uh, uh, sub debates that need to be entered into, and all of the Enlightenment thinkers were entering into those those debates. But on the first one, is reason primary? And the answer, if you say yes, then yes, that is the thing that makes you an Enlightenment thinker. Because here you're, juxt you're juxtaposing reason against the position that says some sort of mystical insight is primary, or subjective feelings are primary, or subjective faith is primary, or appeals to authority are, are primary. It's all those latter four the rejection of those latter four, those are the things that make Enlightenment thinkers all Enlightenment thinkers. The fact that they are going to say reason is the most important fundamental cognitive tool that we have. Now then there's a second question. You know, what is your theory about how that reason works if you think that reason is very important and or primary? And a third question, well, how competent is it? Do you think it's the best, but it's not that, you know, it's better than the alternatives, but it's not that great? Or do you think that it's better than all of the alternatives and it's pretty great and there are going to be different schools of thought within the Enlightenment traditions? So here, uh, they recently, uh, uh, we lost Gertrude Himmelfarb, for example, but others who argued that there are very different schools within the broad Enlightenment label. And Hazoni does not give us any indication here of this very important scholarly point about the the Enlightenment. So sometimes uh, you know, one way of characterizing the different schools of Enlightenment is uh, in nationalistic terms or, or more geographic terms. So there was the English Enlightenment, and here are the important names are Francis Bacon, John Locke, and others. And they're much more empiricist and, and highly confident in the competence of, of reason. But by contrast, uh, there's the French Enlightenment, Descartes, Voltaire, Montesquieu, Condorcet, and others. And they are the ones that are much less empiric empiricist, much more rationalistic. Maybe these are the ones that Hazoni has in mind, but he doesn't name names or get to this level of detail. And, and some of them are much more wildly optimistic about the power of, of reason. So maybe those are the ones that uh, Hazoni has in mind and said, that particular school of enlightenment we need to, uh, to be a little more skeptical about. But then, there, of course, there was the Scottish Enlightenment, David Hume, Adam Smith, Thomas Reed, and others, and they're much more mixed, particularly in the day case of David Hume's, they're much more skeptical. But already, uh, the Enlightenment is a very broad label, and we have to distinguish you know, the English empiricist tradition from the more French rationalistic tradition, and the Scottish Enlightenment tradition, which is uh, perhaps more skeptical, but in some cases much more empirical and closer to the English. And then, of course, uh, we have to talk about the Enlightenment over in the United States, the American American Enlightenment, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Madison, and uh, much more influenced by the English than others. And there's lots and lots of scholarship about the uh, the subspecies, but uh, as far as we can tell from this video from Hazoni, he seems either oblivious to it, and uh, he seems to take only perhaps the most extreme possible version of French rationalist thinking as equivalent to Enlightenment, enlightenment thinking as a whole, and uh, I'm afraid that's just bad history. 
Now, a third sub-point on this eighth, I've got it labeled here as 8C, is claim that we, uh, we make progress, uh, the progress that we have made since the Enlightenment. And to his credit, he's not one of those conservatives who says the entire modern world has been a mistake. He does seem to recognize that in the modern world we have made progress, but we've made progress by adopting the more skeptical traditions and by being more willing to follow custom and tradition. And I think, unfortunately, that's uh, just a much too crude and an often false understanding of the progress that we have made over the course of the last 300 years. My, my sense is that Hazoni is primarily a political thinker, and as a conservative in politics, he's very concerned about political revolutions that have gone, ba gone badly, the French Revolution as an example, and the problems that can happen if you try to change entire societies, their entire cultural and political traditions to traditions. There are lots of examples of this going badly. And that's fair enough you know, as, as a historical point. But politics is only one issue, and uh, it seems rather obvious that in other areas uh, in the modernity, we have made progress not by uh, being skeptical, but by acquiring knowledge and being certain that we have acquired knowledge, and not by being re reluctant to change tradition, but rather by rejecting traditions and rejecting customs very quickly and ruthlessly. For example, as we acquired knowledge of microbes in the 1800s, we started washing our hands very quickly. We were dismissive and angrily revolutionizing our hygiene practices as much as possible, sterilizing medicine, medical instruments uh, quickly. We did it quickly. We rejected the uh, custom. We revolutionized medical practices as quickly as possible. As soon as we learn that slavery is a moral abomination, and as soon as we learn that women are not second-class citizens, we don't say, oh, we need to be skeptical here and revel you know, reverential of age-old, millennia-old customs and traditions uh, you know, that keep women in their place. And you know, how do we really know that slavery is wrong? No, we know that slavery is wrong. We know that women are not are full human beings and should have political rights as well. So we reject those age-old traditions as fast as we can and so on. So there's a question here about what tradition and how quickly we should change it. It's not an either or. All right, that's a quick run through eight points uh, from Hazoni. And my conclusion is I think, unfortunately, Hazoni's video is an example of what I think of as special pleading history. We do have a philosophical position that leads to rather distorted history, you know, very selective history that's serving a philosophical agenda. Now, I understand, you know, conservatives make up a very big tent. Conservatism is a slippery term. But whatever kind of conservatism Prager University believes in, uh, already twice in my Open College podcast series, uh, I've, I've noted there's kind of special pleading history that Prager videos are engaging in. So I will refer listeners to my earlier podcast series, Conservatives Get Over the Dark Ages. And there are all of those conservatives who, uh, out there who seem to think positively about the Dark Ages and more broadly the uh, Middle Ages, and they are negative about the Enlightenment. But notice that. You're big on the Dark Ages and you're anti-Enlightenment. And that I think that's, in my view, the exact opposite of the proper evaluation of both of those eras. All right, one uh, final point on uh, this attack on the Enlightenment from conservative quarters. Uh, I'd like to note a theme that has come up a couple of times in this Open College podcast series. As a more general point, that is to say, at its very simplest, our current cultural debates that sometimes uh, seem on the verge of being culture wars, that our culture debates are a three-way affair, not a two-way affair. We hear a lot of language and a lot of rhetoric in our public discussions about liberal versus conservative, right versus left, and various other binary characterizations. But just notice that in our own generation, that it's the POMO left, the postmodern left, that is attacking the Enlightenment vigorously. And now, as we see in the case of Prager and Hazoni, the conservative right is also attacking the Enlightenment. Both the postmodern left and the conservative right, in some versions, attack reason, individualism, and genuine liberalism. So those of us who are contemporary heirs of the Enlightenment, we make up a third distinct 
alternative. And we must recognize that both the postmoderns on the so-called left and the conservatives of the prager Hazoni type on the so-called right, they are both our joint enemies. <laughs> ¶¶